All right. Um, well, not a very, uh, very uh, encouraging response, but uh, but hopefully by the time we are done, you know, uh, uh, I I wouldn't have put you to sleep, you know, after that lunch. So anyway, my name is uh, Premanand Chandrasekhar, and I, I I work for ThoughtWorks, and uh, and you know, uh, today we'll be talking about functional programming in Java, and uh, you know, one of my uh, colleagues. I told him that you know I'm I'm going to this functional programming conference, and uh, so he asked me, "What are you talking about?" I mean, so uh, so I said, "I'm going to talk about functional programming in Java," and his uh, his facial expression dropped, and I'm like, "What?" You know, so so he tells me, you know, he didn't actually tell me that. This is what I inferred. You know, you're going to a functional programming conference and you're going to talk about Java, really? So. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it, it still, you know, and and uh, to follow up from the keynote today in the morning, right, where uh, where you know the mainstream got completely slammed, right. So this is probably the anti for that, but but we'll see. Uh, so the way that this was supposed to work is that this was supposed to be a workshop, you know, which means that uh, if you want, uh, you are encouraged to to actually code along, uh, but. But if you don't, uh, that's fine too. What we'll do is, uh, you know, we'll walk through an inventory management example, and I'll give you more details around uh, what that actually means. Uh, so, so we I've split it up into several tasks, and these are very small tasks that you can do in two two minutes, maybe even less, right? And uh, and take it from there. Okay. So, uh, so if you are if you are in the mood to actually code. Uh, there is a Git repo available there, uh, you know. And uh, if you want to code along, uh, you probably want to start with the uh, legacy initial and the and the functional initial, which means you know, it has only the portions that are not relevant to the uh, to the talk itself. You know, basic a couple of domain objects which I'll talk about. And and if you if you're not in the mood to program, then uh, uh, then there is there is the completed solution, you know, or at least in my view, what I think is a completed solution. Uh, so you can follow along with that because the slides in this presentation are mostly along that. You know, so so the complete ones are are checked in. To uh, this is in GitHub, so they are checked in in a way where this, these slides move. So for every almost every problem, you have a slide, you have a check in, and then it it actually follows this this presentation. Uh, but if you are like me, then you can just follow along uh, uh, the slide here and not worry about any of that. Okay? All right. I'll I'll leave it up to you. So so let's let's introduce the problem itself, right? So uh, uh, what we are talking about here is is a is a like I said, an inventory management uh, problem. So we are looking at this domain object called product. You know, a product has a, has a category, it has a name, and it has a price. Right, so uh, fairly straightforward, um, and then we'll we'll talk about this thing called an item. Uh, what is an item? An item is 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 a product, but it also has a quantity associated with it. And uh, you store items in a warehouse. Okay, so a warehouse basically has a set of items, right? And what we'll try to do is we'll try to build features around around these domain objects. Okay, so far so so far so good. All right. So uh, the, the first task is for us to to print names of all items in inventory. So you've got the warehouse. Uh, the warehouse has a set of items, like I said. You you basically the task is to to build to to output all the names of the items that are in inventory. And in inventory meaning, if you go back to uh, uh, item. Uh, an item is in stock if the quantity is greater than zero, right? So, so what you have to do is you have to try and print that out. Uh, do you want me to wait a wait a few seconds before before I actually show you what I would have done if this was uh, me? How do you want to do this? Or should I just go ahead? Go ahead. Okay. All right. I'll do that. So, if I were to do this myself, right? I mean, and uh, this is this is typically how I would do it, right? So you've got a, a typical for loop. You're iterating over the items, and uh, this this method you can think of as a method in the warehouse class, right? So uh, and then if the item is in stock, I just print it out. Okay, so far so good. Um, 
So, no, I mean, okay, fine. I mean, this is this is very imperative and this is very uh, you know uh, very verbose and all that. But but if this is all I have to do, this works, right? Everybody here most likely understands what is happening here. It's not too hard to comprehend, correct? But if I were to tell you, you know, okay, here is another problem. Print names of all in stock items of a particular category, right? How would you do that? So if I were to do that, then uh, I would do something like this, you know, so take in an input category and then uh, iterate over the items. If the item is in stock and if the item is of a certain category, then print it out, okay? Uh, no issues there. Now, if you look, if you combine the two, right? So you have got these two methods. One which takes in nothing as an input and the other which takes in a category as input. And if you look at them, they, they look pretty much identical, isn't it? You know, so in terms, of, in terms of what they have, except for one small detail which is the, which is the conditional inside that, that loop, right? So if I were to tell you, you know, print the names of all items which are not in stock, would you create a third method? And if I were to tell you some arbitrary combination like that, tell me all of the items whose price is greater than $100, for example, right? So, so the, the problem here is that if, if you get requirements like this, then it's not really sustainable for us to keep adding methods to this warehouse class, right? So, so firstly, it's, it's too much duplication. You know, I could do that. You know, I could basically say every time I get a new requirement, I, I add another method and it will still work, but it's pretty much, it look almost like this, right? Again, it's, it's not sustainable because, because like, you know, you'll, you'll end up with, with methods which almost do the same thing. So, uh, so it's not sustainable and it's too brittle. So if I want to change something, I have to change it in, in 10 different places. Right? So, um, so what is really the problem here, right? If you look at these two methods, like I said before, those two conditionals are the only things that are different, right? So in the first one, if, is the item in stock? In the second one, is the item in stock and is, is it of a certain category, right? So if I were to, if I were to anticipate and, and build for an arbitrary, uh, almost arbitrary set of conditions, then what I probably want to do is I want to externalize that search criteria. So instead of taking in uh, these uh, search, uh, you know, search parameters like this individually, if I were to abstract that in something called a search criteria, then uh, maybe I don't have to do all of this duplication, right? So, uh, so what I do then is I, I do this refactor and I say, okay, I'll create an interface called, and, and I'll call it item search criteria, okay? And it has a single method in it called test. It takes in an item, okay? So if I were to re-implement uh, this thing, right? So I've got item search criteria, and then now instead of taking in uh, anything else, it takes in this item search criteria, and then, if, and then it says, uh, pretty much like what it did last time. Now, instead of testing for the conditional itself, it's actually saying, does it actually pass the criteria that I specify, right? Uh, so the advantage that I have is what I can do now is I can build something like this, you know, so uh, I create an in-stock search criteria, and then you see the, the conditional now is external to that method itself. And now I can say, create an inventory method which, which passes in an in-stock uh, search criteria. Has anyone done something like this? A lot of folks have done it, right? So, uh, or maybe you haven't. Maybe you have done the, the part that is of the first one that I was showing, right? You know, so, so again, nevertheless, right? So this is not hard to comprehend. Now, so, <clears throat> If I were to do this, so now I've got this, this class called in stock uh, search criteria. But because it's, it's really, uh, it really, you can, what you can do is you can inline that and you can, you can create what is called an anonymous inner class in Java because, because really you don't want to create uh, an in stock category item search criteria and, and so on and so forth, right? You don't want to keep creating these classes. So what typically people do is 
uh, they, they create these anonymous inner classes and then now you have, you have basically uh, uh, you know, shortened the amount of code that you write. Otherwise, you have to write that class and then you have to use that class and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> so to recap, so what we have is this inventory method which looked originally like that and now it looks something like, like this. So you've got this uh, anonymous inner class and uh, but in terms of in terms of the number of lines of code you probably written more than what you what you did previously right so so again i mean it's 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 okay but but i don't know if it probably does not it solves the problem of there is probably less duplication and what you can do is you can test the search criteria object that you create individually every time and you can just test that and be sure that as long as i write uh, and test the criteria object this inventory method will actually give me the right results, right? So, <clears throat> so if I were to ask you to do a third task, which is now uh, to print the names of products, okay? So, uh, remember we said items actually have a reference to a product, right? Because an item really is is a product with just a quantity. So, if I were to do that, and if I were to use the same strategy that I used, where you create an interface, and now you say product search criteria, right? So again, it looks pretty much similar to what we did the previous time. Instead, now instead of item search criteria, which takes in an item, it takes in a product, right? So, so now we have two interfaces. We have product search criteria and item search criteria. Is there a way we can refactor this with, without using uh, black magic? How would you do that? Anyone? Yep. Uh, sure, lambdas is one, but what if you don't have lambdas? Generics, yep. You know, so, uh, so what I would do is I would say, okay, yeah, I mean, if you look at these two, they are identical almost, except for the, the difference in, in the names and the, and the uh, input that they take in, right? But other than that, they, they are pretty much the same. So what I would do is I would, I would genericize this and say, okay, it takes in a generic type T, and, and now it has this, this test on that generic type T. So you can pass in any arbitrary, uh, any arbitrary class, and now you can have a search criteria for that class, right? So if you look back at that inventory method, now it will start looking something like, like this. So I pass in the search criteria of an item, and then, and then now uh, Java with its generics magic does this, and then now I can pass in an item directly, and then I can do the same thing that I was doing, right? So, <clears throat> but still, you know, but this this is still still too verbose. You know, it's it's uh, it's still quite a bit of clutter, correct? The only thing really that you're that you're interested in is the is the line of code which says return item is in stock, right? So, but if you don't have uh, Java 8, what do you do? One thing that, that I try to do is, uh, what you can do is you can extract the search criteria item into a, into a constant, because it does not depend on anything else. This can actually be written, rewritten as a constant. So, so now I, I say this, this thing is the in stock search criteria, okay, for an item. And then I can, I can write it as inventory in stock. At least it reads well, right? So, uh, so if you don't look at the, the declaration of that in stock, and if you're looking at this most of the time, then you know, okay, this is trying to do uh, an, a search for inventory in stock, right? A big deal, you know, so. But if you use an IDE like, like uh, IntelliJ IDEA, for example, what it will do is uh, it can actually collapse it this way. So, uh, so what, you know, this is actually Java 7 code or anything lesser than Java 7, but IntelliJ IDEA, and maybe even Eclipse, I've, I've not really checked, uh, will actually allow you to, to look at it this way. If you collapse, if you expand it, it'll look like, like that in, uh, anonymous inner class, but, but otherwise it'll look like this, right? So this, so people who complain that I have to look at a lot of code, you know, that, that's an answer for them, right? Okay, so you have to look at less because this is the part that you're actually interested in. Um, but if you're doing Java 6 or Java 7, that's pretty much it. Uh, what you can do is you can use uh, a library like uh, Java has these libraries called Guava, which is from Google. They have a whole bunch of functional. Uh, they have a, 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 
well, I shouldn't say functional. I mean, they actually say functional interfaces. So they have a bunch of interfaces that you have, that they have already written. So they have, so instead of search criteria, they call their search criteria something called a predicate. Okay. Uh, Apache Commons also has something similar. Now, so, so you can use some of that so that you don't have to write all of this. Right? But, but pretty much that's it. You know, as far as Java 6 is concerned, or Java 7. So if you were to say, okay, let's move on to Java 8, right? And uh, and I must say, you know, uh, Venkat stole a little bit of my thunder this morning by showing you Java code, but but okay, you know, so some of it is going to be repetitive maybe, uh, but bear with me. Okay, so um, so what do we have? Uh, we have the search criteria, right? We have this inventory method, right? And uh, and then we have the actual implementation which, which says, okay, here is how I actually use a search criteria object to, to find items in stock. So, so that's pretty much to do, to print an item that is in stock, that's the amount of code that I have to write, okay? So now we do have Java 8, so the answer is, okay, we can use lambdas, right? So if we were to use lambdas, so that code can now become that. That, okay. So, so as you can see here, the the thing that looked like that can look like this now. So it's it's a lot more terse, right? It tells you what uh, uh, what it is actually doing, and uh, because ja the Java 8 compiler is a little bit more advanced than what it was previously, it has this additional capability of doing some kind of type inference, right? Uh, so. What you can do is instead of writing it like this, you can write it like that. So what you can do is you can omit the fact that this is an item, and the compiler will actually give you an error if it if you pass in anything that is not an item. But uh, but implicitly the assumption is that it is an item. Okay. So so that's that's all well well and good. You can actually take it a little bit further. You know. So as you can see now here. You're calling a uh, method in the item class. So what you can do is you can actually use something called method references, which looks which look like all right. I guess I have too many transitions. There you go. Okay. So um, so you can do this double colon syntax, where what you're saying is you're basically saying the exact same thing but you're saying it that way, where now uh, you have to write even lesser, arguably, right? But all of the three syntaxes that you have seen so far, they are all identical. You know, there's, there's no difference as far as when it gets translated to bytecode, it's the exact same thing that, uh, that the compiler produces. But, uh, but now you've got uh, terseness, if nothing else. A little bit of Java 8 Gyan, right? I mean, uh, I, I promise not to bore you with uh, too much of the theoretical uh, or technical details, but a little bit is is, is probably needed here. Uh, so, so you've got this uh, interface called search criteria right now, and it has a single uh, method that is abstract, meaning a single unimplemented method, right? So, uh, it's actually called a functional interface. You know, so in Java 8, this is called a functional interface. And uh, what is a functional interface? A functional interface is one, an interface which has a single method without an implementation. The reason why without an implementation is in bold is because in Java 8 now, you can actually have met, uh, interfaces which have implementations in them. You know, so they, they call default implementations. You know, so, uh, and, and we'll come to that and how and why they actually re were required to do something like this because this is pretty drastic, right? So far, uh, Java has avoided having any behavior in, in interfaces under the pretext of trying to avoid the diamond problem, right? So, uh, but, but they have actually gone, gone back on that. So now, just like in Scala, uh, you can have interfaces or traits, just like in Scala traits, you can have uh, interfaces which have implementation in them. <coughs> Excuse me? Did anyone, ha anyone have anything to say? All right. Okay, so what you can do is, uh, so in addition to that, right, you can force the compiler to, uh, you can mark uh, um, interface, interfaces like this, 
uh, with this functional interface annotation. What that gives you is, uh, is you know, so <clears throat> it prevents somebody from adding another method, right? If they add another abstract method to this interface, uh, the, the compiler will actually give you an error saying this is declared as a functional interface, which means it can only have a single abstract method in it. So, uh, so that's, that's something that they have added as sugar in, in, in Java 8. There are several of these uh, functional interfaces which are available in this, in this new package now. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you uh, browse through that and, uh, and you know, uh, get more. So, <clears throat> so coming back, that whole thing can now become that. Okay, so if using the standard interfaces that are available, in the Java, uh, in the Java standard package library, you can do this now. So items is a is a collection, and then and then you've got this additional method called stream. All collections now have this method called stream, and it is actually a method on the. I think it's either collection or iterable. You know, one of the two. I can't remember which one. So it's actually an implemented method. You know, so you can override what stream does, but it's actually there. And all collections get it. Okay, so one of the reasons why the designers of Java chose to uh, uh, enhance interfaces to have implementation is basically to allow something like this to happen, where they didn't want you, the the implementer of a, of a collection, to provide a, a stream method from scratch. So they actually do that for you. You can obviously override it, but but it's already there, so you don't have to do anything. So as long as you have got a collection interface you get that stream method for free. So what is this doing? So you basically have this thing called a stream, which is, you can think of it as a, you know, the, the, the simplest analogy is, is that uh, you've, got a, you've got a stream of, of data coming in. So if you're looking at a YouTube video, right, you actually, are, you're getting a stream of data, which then renders into a, into a video, right? So you can think of it in those terms, right? So, so now, given that I've got a stream of, of items, I'm filtering it, and then uh, using filtering it using the item is in stock, which we just saw. And then what I'm doing is I'm mapping it, meaning I'm converting it, adapting it uh, into a, a, a collection again, or a stream actually, of, of names of those items. So now I'll, I'll end up with a, because I've, I've transformed this, I'll end up with a, with a stream of, of strings, which are basically the names of those items. And then finally, for each, I'll print them out. Okay, so so all of that became that much, right? Pretty terse, pretty neat, huh? So um, some of the more popular standard functional interfaces, you know, so filter is one you saw, you know, which again uh, gives you a, a subset or can give you a subset of the of the stream that you're working with. Okay, and then and then map again to convert one uh, one form into another. So if you've got items, you want to convert them into the names of those items, you would use something like a map, right? And then for each, which you again saw, uh, which is basically a bunch of actions that you want to do. Uh, so this, this is more, this is less functional, because what this does is it actually, uh, it does some mutating, op you can do anything pretty much, you know, but it does not return you back a result. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's not functional like like um, a map or a filter, okay? It is, it is also called a terminal operation uh, in, 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 uh, in Java parlance, uh, meaning it, it is something that forces uh, work to get done. Remember in the morning, uh, Venkat was talking about these things being lazy, right? So a lot of the uh, methods on stream actually return back a stream itself, you know? So, so you, when you filter a stream, you get back a filtered stream. When you map, you get back another a mapped stream. So, so until you've got, and all of those are called uh, intermediate operations. Intermediate operations don't require uh, the API to do any work. You know, so if you were to just stop by doing a filter or a map, nothing will happen. Okay, uh, but a for each, for example, will actually force work to get done. So, um, so having having said that, so if we were to do this now, uh, filter in stock items and then print the whole item itself, not just the name, 
So this is fairly straightforward to do now. So you should you should have got the, the drift of this. So now you say items are stream, filter in stock items. Uh, so we we were mapping them to the name right now. So we we say okay, we'll map it to uh, to something else. So let's say we have. Okay, so there you go. So you have, let's say you've got an overridden two string method on the item. So you, you can do that, right? So what if you don't have a method, right? So you can always always go back to the to the lambda syntax. So you've got two, you've got method references and you've got lambdas. So in this case, it's doing some arbitrary thing with uh, with the item itself. So it's taking the name and then concatenating concatenating the the quantity. You know, so but you could do anything you want to do with right so let's say if you let's say you want to print the number of items in inventory so if you want to do that how would you do that um, so in java 6 you would do something like this right you saw this you start with the sum of zero then you add uh, you keep accumulating uh, the quantity and then finally you output the sum so in reality, what actually are we doing here? If we were to decompose this, we're doing three things. One, we are providing an initial or a default value. So if there is no item in the collection, then it will return a zero. And, and again, it's also an initial value because uh, everything starts with a zero when you're doing a sum, right? Uh, second thing you're doing is you are accumulating a result, right? So when you say, sum equals sum plus quantity, that is basically uh, accumulating the result. And then finally, you are, uh, you are combining the result into the sum itself and returning it. So if you were to do this in a functional way, what you would do is something like that. So you would, you would call this the reduce operation. It's exactly the same as what was happening there. So you're starting with an initial value, you're then accumulating, and then you're finally consolidating into a result. Okay, if this seems like Greek and Latin, then, uh, then there is an easier way to do this, right? So this is equivalent to that, but again, it might take you a little while to get used to this uh, way of thinking about it, right? So there is a, an easier way. So what you do is you, you have a, a stream of items, and then you map them to the item's quantity, and then you reduce them using a sum function. So, so the reduce here takes in a function by itself, you know, and and uh, and and you'll you'll see them being called higher order functions in some in some places. So, so here, what you're saying is you're you uh, after the map, you'll basically end up with a with a collection of ints, or rather, uh, technically a stream of ints, and then you'll apply the sum function to each one of those. Uh, items in the stream, starting with the value of zero, right? So, <clears throat> if you were to do that, then uh, integer already has a, a method called sum, so you can use that instead of doing that, uh, writing out the sum function yourself. So you can use the built-in, right? Uh, it's it's identical again. Even more conveniently, what you can do is you can say I've got a stream of items. I want to map them to a, a stream of ints. Now, map to int actually returns me a, a specialized stream called int stream. And then on the int stream, I've got a method called sum, and I can just use that. So this is a lot more intention clarifying than the previous two, right? Although all of these three are just as functional as the other, but this is probably more intention clarifying. Terminal operations, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, so you can think of uh, you can think of this as being equivalent to uh, to a builder, right? So, uh, so has anybody used the builder pattern? So, if you're you know, so if you're creating a, a, a complex object, you know, a, a, a f fairly frequently used pattern is is you know, you say, uh, let's say I'm creating what. Um, uh, an item, right? An item has a price, has a name, has uh, associations with other things, and so and a lot of them are not mandatory. So you can basically keep building and then finally say, I, I want an item. 
right so you can think of this stream being equivalent to a builder and the sum being the in this case the terminal operation sum is the is the final thing where you actually build the result but if you don't do that then nothing is going to happen right um okay so next task if you were to print the number of items in in all our warehouses so assume you've got a uh, a bunch of warehouses and you want to pr print the number of items in all of those warehouses right so if it helps the java way would be something like this right you start with a total of 0 then you iterate over the warehouses then you iterate over each item in each of those warehouses and then you uh, accumulate the quantity and then you finally uh, print the total right so so again i mean this is something that most people understand but again if you look at it, it that the double for loop is is, is pretty ugly right so if you were to rewrite this in functional terms then what you would do is you would say uh use this thing called the flat map right so you can think of a, a flat map being equivalent and, and and other languages call this the fold operation right uh, so flat map being you've got a collection of collections and you want a flat collection of uh those collection of collection so you've got a collection of warehouses and the warehouse each warehouse has a collection of items so you flat map uh, items in the warehouse so you get a flattened collection of of items across all of the warehouses right so uh, so that's a flat map and then you you do the same thing that you did previously you map them to an int and then you sum it okay any questions um <clears throat> what we can also do okay um we just saw this right yeah oh sorry so the next task right print the item with the least amount across warehouses so you want to find out which item has the least number of items okay so uh, the way to do that is again in in java 6 now what you have to do is not only do you have to track the minimum quantity you also have to track that item which has that minimum quantity so this one looks very similar to the the previous example except now you are also tracking uh, the item which has the least quantity and then you you print it out so in functional terms what you would do is you would say warehouses dot stream and then uh, you would flat map it to uh, a, a stream of items and then you would say min and then here what you're doing is you are using a a, a min function a function to compare uh, to uh <coughs> a two items you know so so you flat map it to items and then uh, this thing will compare two items using the quantity so again uh this is obviously expressible slightly more conveniently so what you can do is you can say comparator dot comparing item dot quantity or item colon quantity right so so it's exactly the same what you can also do is um is you can make item implement the comparable interface thereby giving items a uh, some natural ordering so numbers have a natural order one is greater than two and so on right so uh if you do that with the item then what you can do is you can do this you can say uh flat map it to a a a stream of items and then compare them using the natural order of the item uh notice that i have very subtly switched over to using a parallel stream and this is something that that venkat uh, mentioned in in the morning so it it's very straightforward to actually do this in a way where you do it sequentially using the stream method and then you you do it using the parallel stream where now it's 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 all of this is going to happen uh you know in in parallel you know so the 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 fact of actually having to deal with multi threaded code is is greatly diminished by just doing that right um Yes. Uh 
So, so the, the, the way I understand your question is, you know, is it internally implemented the same way as the, the double for loop, right? Perhaps it is. Perhaps it is, perhaps it's not. You know, so the thing is that it is, the, the thing to consider here is that that part of doing it is abstracted away from you. You know, so the double for loop is, is basically focusing on, on how to do it, right? Whereas this focuses on what? And this is also something that, uh, that, that Venkat mentioned in the morning. So if there were a, a, a better way of doing it, then uh, you don't have to think about it as being implemented as a, as a double for loop to do that. Now, in reality, maybe it is implemented as a double for loop, or maybe it's not. But that, again, is not your concern any, anymore. Right? It's a concern of the implementer of the library. So there are two ways, right? So now one, what you can do is you can flat map it, and then you can filter. Or you can filter and then flat map, right? So you can filter first and then flat map. Either way, it doesn't matter because, uh, because these are, are mutually exclusive operations. So as long as you want to get to the result of filtering in some, using some criteria, and then getting a list of, uh, getting a, a stream of items, right? So it doesn't matter how you arrive at it. So in the case of a min, which is the terminal operation, you can't conclude without having looked at every, every item in, 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 which is under consideration. So, so it doesn't matter if you're using the min as your, uh, as your terminal operation. You have to do, you have to go through every, every one, right? But, but, the, but the flat mapping itself can happen in parallel. So you've got, let's say, 10 warehouses. Each of the items in those warehouses can be collected concurrently. Right, as opposed to have, as opposed to doing it uh, serially in the case of the double for loop. So in the double for loop, you are forcing yourself to say, first I look at warehouse number one's uh, uh, items, then warehouse number two, and and so on and so forth. Whereas now with this, you can go all parallel and keep collecting the mins, and then say, okay, here is here is the mins from each of the warehouses, and then I can say, okay, get me the mins from the mins. Right. Say that again. Okay. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. In that case, in that case, then it it, it is uh, so it's not main. So it's the first. Let's say you say find first, right? Then, then there is no need to do anything more than more than just looking at the first item and, uh, item and returning you the first item, and and the order is again. Uh, is, is in this case non-deterministic because you have not specified any order, right? So, so yeah, I mean, there it might not be implemented as a double for loop, right? But in the case of a min, you probably have to go through every one of them. So the find first is a lot more uh, is a lot less expensive than the, than the min, uh, but again, it depends on on each terminal operation individually. So. If you are doing all of this in Java 6, what do you do, right? Uh, you don't have Java 8. How many, actually I forgot to ask, how many of, of us are actually working with Java 8 right now? Okay, how many of us are working with, with Java 5 but greater or equal to Java, uh, uh, sorry, Java 7 to Java 5, Java 5 to Java 7, a majority, okay. Uh, and is there anyone who's working with uh, something pre-Java 1.5, like 1.4, 1.3? Okay, I'm sorry for you. Um, so firstly, you know, you need to stop whining. You know, so it's not the end of the world. So Java 8 is, is pretty cool in terms of uh, the APIs that, uh, that it introduces, but, uh, but it's not the end of the world. A lot of it 
is available, it's not as, uh, you know, so, so lambda really, I mean, lambda and the method references, they're all syntactic sugar on top of what is the anonymous uh, inner class, right? Uh, anonymous instances, they are basically, all of them are anonymous instances. So, uh, so it is still possible to do all of this with uh, libraries like uh, Guava. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, go look at it. Uh, again, you know, so it may not result in, in, uh, in as terse uh, code as, as you see here, but, but it, you can actually tend towards that. Uh, so, so, so it is possible though. It does require a little bit of effort and sometimes it might feel a little unnatural. So like you said, you know, the, the, if you've got very small use cases, then having to go through the pain of creating an interface and then implementing an anonymous inner class for that interface might, might be uh, too much of a, uh, of a hassle to do. But if, but if you've got a lot of uh, search uh, functionality, then you might want to uh, you know, consider either using something that Guava itself provides or, or implementing something of your own if Guava is not an option. Uh, one thing that you can do is, as you can see here, streams are, are immutable. They, they are they read only, uh, they, they basically are, are not on the collection. So, so they could have done all of this on the collection interface itself, right? But the, the reason why the, the designers of the language chose to create this thing called a stream was they wanted to do this, make this clear distinction of, of this actually being a read-only view of your underlying collection, right? So, so firstly, I mean, you, if you want to get to being functional, prefer working with final variables. So what that means is try not reassigning variables. Try not uh, stooping to using setters, for example. Try passing in dependencies through your constructor. So then what you can do is then the Java uh, compiler will allow you to mark your instance variables as final, right? Or your, or your method parameters as final so that you, I, I guess nobody does a reassigning of method parameters anymore, but, but instance uh, members, right? Avoid reassigning them by passing in initial values through your constructor and make them final. And see if you can actually get it to a place where you don't have to modify it. Uh, it definitely is possible. But, but again, try doing that and see how much you have to change, right? So if you're, if you're in Java 6, again, something you can do is to minimize the use of void methods. Void methods are evil because, so have, you know, so remember the first task that we worked on, the, the one where I said, create a, you know, here is a list of items and print the name of those items. That method was actually a void method, right? Uh, if you were to write a test for that method, you will have to go through a, a lot to be able to test the fact that you're printing uh, the name correctly. So prefer the use of methods which take an input, do not mutate the input, and return some output. And then you'll also find that it's a lot more easier not only to test, uh, but also to, uh, to, to understand what is happening. Void methods prevent that from, uh, you know, they, they basically say, I'm going to do something with the input that you gave me. I don't know what, right? Uh, and, and the only way to test that is through a side effect. So, so an example of that is, uh, uh, let's say I, I've got, uh, I've got a, a method which updates the price of an item, right? So I say set price, and now inside the item I, I, I have a price uh, attribute, I update the value of it to a new value. Now how do I test that? I have to test that by saying item.getPrice and, and assert its value, right? So, so the only way to test those kinds of methods is, is through some kind of side effect. So again, you'll find that uh, your designs improve when you try avoiding void methods. But again, I mean, avoiding void methods may not be possible all the time. Given that uh, void methods are unavoidable, try to eliminate them to the periphery of what you're doing. So, uh, so for example, you saw those terminal operations, right? Those terminal operations were the last thing that you did, and, and that, it, it, it's like that for a reason, right? Because everything that follows before actually does either a transform or a filter, right? 
and most operations can be expressed uh, in the form of a transform or a filter. So map, flat map, uh, or filter, right? Uh, these these three are, are 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 the most important functional operations. So so all of those actually take an input and return output, and and the final thing that you do is your transform or is your uh, is your actual mutation. If you have to do it, uh, restrict it to being at the periphery of, of what you're doing. And then what you can do is you can, you can test, you can, uh, you can uh, control the design of what you're doing uh, for a majority of your system uh, without the use of wide methods. Uh, this one is fairly straightforward. Uh, avoid mutable globals. So now uh, when I say mutable globals in, in Java, it basically means static, right? So, so the singleton. Uh, is is a classic example of that. So avoid avoid actually writing uh, singletons. Uh, you can use semantic singletons. So so you've got uh, what, what I mean by semantic singleton is, uh, for example, if you're working with something like a dependency injection container, like like Spring, right? So Spring can actually tell you you can write the object just like you would do as if it were not a singleton, and then you can mark it either in the class itself as being a singleton, which means the container will only create one instance of it ever, right? So, uh, uh, so avoid use of, use of singleton and avoid use of use of global state. But, but that doesn't mean static methods are evil, you know. So I, I'd like to clarify. So static methods that do not mutate are actually functional, right? As you can see, the sum function it is is uh, is a static method on on integer. Uh, but but it's not it's not evil because what it does is it takes in two inputs and returns back output. So that is okay. But uh, a static mutable thing is 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 bad because that is something that you you'll find yourself uh, mutating in several places. And and when you mutate something in several places, you have to keep track of them. You have to you have to worry about concurrency and all of those those things that uh, Venkat mentioned in the morning. Uh, finally, avoid avoid returning returning nulls. You know, null is the is the bane of 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 uh, you know. I, I don't know who it was who said that uh, the the single most evil thing is 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 the uh, is the null keyword. So, uh, what that means is you either return something that is not null, which is a substitute of the null, uh, or return empty collections, right? As opposed to returning nulls. The reason why then. You can you can actually focus on on doing the real thing that you want to do as opposed to you know uh, you know spreading your code with with null checks everywhere, right? Finally, if you are in the Java world, read this book. Effective Java is is, is really awesome. You know, although he doesn't mention Joshua Block doesn't actually mention functional anywhere explicitly, but the style of code that he actually advocates is very much along the functional paradigm. And this this existed years ago. I mean, years ago, years before a functional took off as as the next big thing, right? So so that book actually gives you lots of ideas on how to actually do it uh, in a way where you can you, where you can uh, avoid all of those anti patterns that uh, that I mentioned here. Uh, again, you know, so I mentioned looking looking at the the Guava or the or the Apache Commons Lang library, right? So this is something that that the Guava documentation actually says, and and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd say it here. You know, so so if uh, if you are in Java six, Java seven land, you know, use some caution. Now you go from this this uh, uh, this conference here, and and don't try to make everything functional tomorrow, right? You know, so so again, that that's really good advice from the Guava documentation, and those guys are really awesome as well. You know, so so Google doesn't mess around, right? Uh, but again, it's 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 pretty good advice. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Use of nulls, right? Uh, and this is also something that is very common in a lot of other languages. So uh, the the concept here is: remember, again, you want to find the item with the least quantity. Uh, so now, what you can do is when you return a min, right? Of the of the item, you actually don't return an item. You return a, what is called an optional item. Okay. So what this means is, 
I may not return you anything. And, and, and optional is something that's, that's, a, new, uh, that's a new thing in, in Java 8. It already exists in uh, these libraries like Wava and so on and so forth, but this is now part of the standard library. What this tells you is, I may not give you anything because there may not be anything to give you. Right? If, if, the, if there are no warehouses, and if those warehouses have no items, then, uh, then there is no way I can give you a min because there isn't a min. Right? So in that case, you return an optional. And the advantage of using an optional, so uh, one question is, okay, I've got an optional, so how do I know if it has something or not? Right? You have to actually ask. You have to, you have to ask the option, do you have anything? If you do, then give it to me. Right? That's the way to, you, you actually conclude. But the advantage that you get by using an optional is that you can interchange the use of an optional with a collection. So you can iterate over it just like you would do on a stream or a collection. Right? So, uh, so what, what it allows you to do is you can, you can now treat that item that you get, the optional item, you can further chain more uh, operations on it and it will not blow up with a null pointer exception because optional is smart enough to, to not return something and, and do the right thing when there is nothing uh, in the min to do. Okay, so, so another thing to do is uh, if, you are, if, you are, if you are forced to return nulls right now, uh, in, in, in Java 8, you can use optional which is part of the standard library, but, uh, but if you are not on Java 8, Guava or, or Apache Commons have this concept of an optional which you can consider using. But again, it's, it has its wrinkles because uh, the ones that are in Guava and, and, uh, and Apache Commons land uh, don't, are not substitutable for iteration. You know, so it's not, it's not a, uh, a direct thing that you can use like this here where it's a substitute for a null. It's just a substitute for a null, but it's still something that you can use as documentation. If you are forced to return null, you return an optional of an item and, uh, and, and, and uh, avoid, you know, the proliferating a whole bunch of null checks. Uh, that's, the, that's the thing I had. Uh, yep, please. Um, so, yeah, so the ben benchmark, this off category method, it actually takes in a category that is, uh, that is not part of this function. You see this category is passed in. So I'm, I'm looking here to see if an item is in stock and it belongs to a certain category here. You see that? Now this category is not part of this function, right? So you can't actually create a constant out of it you're actually passing in context which is not part of the function into the function. So in Java 7, when you're doing anonymous inner classes uh, or, or, or anything below that, you have to declare that as final. I mean, lots of us have encountered that, right? In Java 8, the same constraint still remains, okay? Uh, the only difference is that you don't have to declare, declare it as final explicitly. You can, you can remove the final keyword but if you try to mutate that within the context of your function, it will actually complain and give you a compiler error. Okay, so, so but, but other languages like, like Ruby or Scala uh, will allow you to do just all of this just fine. You don't have to worry about, uh, about, about those kind of semantics. So, so again, you know, so the, to, to answer your questions, uh, question explicitly, if you've got a whole bunch of Java developers, then, uh, then it, then it might probably be easier to make the transition to Java 8 because uh, in terms of the number of new concepts that you have to learn, they are probably much smaller, but you get a lot of the benefits. But, uh, but if you're looking for a more radical change, then, uh, then you probably might want to look elsewhere. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.